moving over, all right? <laughs> okay. I'll do a little introduction here for this. Okay. So, um, Chair down. <laughs> I'm not sure which of the yeah one of, the, one of those levers. Oh, there we go. I lever. found it. Yeah. There we go. And it's never the same <laughs> thing. Like chair. Don't, oh, exactly. Don't Every brand the, the chair puts that. It's kind of the third some, lever I find, and all yeah. of a sudden, <laughs> it's right enough. It's and it works, right? Um, well, welcome to our third Thursday uh, for the month of December. Um, we do this every. Technically, every third Thursday, not every third Thursday of the month, but it really every third Thursday. Um, but we won't do any between now and uh, I think January 28th will be the next one. And uh, at that time, um, Owen Guthrie and I will be talking about podcasting and screencasting. So if you have an interest in podcasting and screencasting, that's coming up. And um, since as faculty, we send out a faculty focused newsletter and we also send out the third Thursday reminder. So um, if you know of folks who don't get that, let us know and we'll add them to the list. Uh, today, we've got a great opportunity uh, if you're having interest in technology and disability services. And we all have students who fall into those categories and oftentimes don't know what are the options that are out there and how do I go about finding those options and accessing those options. And fortunately, Mary was available today, so okay. I'll turn it over so to you. So I wanted to kind of make this into a dialogue between us about various <clears throat> sort of issues that come up where technology interfaces with disability services. And particularly because so much more is being offered online or through the internet, it is potentially creating problems for accessibility. So my office is in the Whitaker Building, and um, because UAF is small, we, of course, always try to individualize our accommodations because we have the advantage of being able to do that. My office serves about 300 people annually. And, um, you know, uh, the accommodations commonly are in areas of testing. Uh, so uh, the most common was additional time for tests. Um, and test in a quiet remove setting. So in terms of um, the things I want to talk about is how to continue to accommodate students and of course keep us out of trouble with compliance issues with uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, particularly where we're using websites, YouTubes, all kinds of other things are integrated in classrooms. And, um, you know, it only really takes one lawsuit complaint and then we have inspectors and other kinds of things and they end up looking at everything so, <laughs> so that's why i'm concerned uh increasingly about um you know how we are doing our interfaces when we're using all the different medias that are now available and how we're, um, who has oversight of those, how that oversight happens, and like who to contact when there's a problem. So I'm going to kind of run through my list here, and I want to hear from you guys how to, you know, when I'm raising some of these questions. Okay, so what are some of the accessibility issues that we have? One is with Blackboard and understanding what uh, is compatible with Blackboard and what is not, okay? So if a student, uh, a common thing that a visually impaired student would do or a student who has learning disabilities is they would use a reading software, okay? So basically reading software is, you know, text to speech. And so the cursor is going to be following the word and reading it out loud. So um, we have students who use these type of softwares and then we have to look at whether or not the course, which has a either a Blackboard component or an online component is accessible, okay? And how those materials are gonna be conveyed to the students. So 
question is, who checks on Blackboard accessibility issues? Is there any assigned person? Or how, say, we have an identified student who's going to be in a class and they want to access something on Blackboard. How would we find out if their particular software can be used and is compatible with Blackboard? I would call you first, Mary. Okay. you would know who to contact. <laughs> right. Well, I'm saying in for support or backup support in OIT, like we need to identify some people that can help us out because so we don't necessarily. Don't exist at this hmm? point. There, there no, somebody. well, there's no one like, who do we go to? Okay. Because this student has called us. The student, in fact, may be living <laughs> out of state or in a small village, which we have had this issue. The student's out. I mean, we don't even have basically face to face contact. And they call and say, I have this software. And can I access my Blackboard info with it? So, Okay, so our problem is tracking down everyone. You know, we may or may not have the same software as the students asking for. So, you know, how we kind of as a team manage a situation that requires those kind of, you know, go to people availability, you know, so in some ways, I guess what would be really important for disability services is having a list of contact people or somebody who would have knowledge to spend some time with us and help us figuring out some of these problems, you know. And I don't know, Gary, how if that's a possibility to generate, you know, some way. Um, another idea would be on your own website, OIT website, having an accessibility issue button for the student. So they can say, you know, okay, they can email a problem to someone who has all the, you know, current expertise in the areas. So that's a, a suggestion about uh, accessibility, compatibility, questions for Blackboard, and questions for online classes. You know, being able to give the student ease of access and kind of get through some of those issues that come up. So if as a faculty member we encountered a student who said that, okay, there's this thing up on Blackboard and my software can't read it, would the first stop be you or yeah, OIT? Yeah, I mean, they could call us and then we would have to work with someone in OIT regarding the issue. Okay, so with um, the other part is, uh, of course, training in faculty on use of things that are accessible and not accessible, which is a you know, a second question here is that um, faculty, you know, being aware of the issues of using many of these things that come up. Uh, many, many faculty use YouTubes. Okay. So basically, one of the issues that arises on the use of YouTube is um, captioning. Now, that is something else that's a little bit difficult is um, trying to like we have tried to use caption youtube has a captioning kind of thing mm -hmm. okay but it's not that straightforward or simple so maybe like oit and disability services teaming up to um, do a training on the how to's so that people know how to plug in certain things for getting the captions and some that, of us use YouTube and other video resources and audio resources in, right. in the physical classroom too. So right, exactly. So I think both of those. Would yeah. Be so by that. a train, some sort of thing where people are offered trainings on really the nuts and bolts of um, media accessibility. And you know, I don't have the expertise that OIT has in all of these things, but I do think it would be important to have one identified OIT personnel that's going to, you know, really scrutinize accessibility and be able to offer solutions and training so we find some things out of compliance. You know, because my fear is what so often happens with faculty too is 
heads upping on the use of these things as opposed to being spontaneous because when it's spontaneous it ta will take us time if we have to caption something to caption it so when um, faculty is using stuff and we know there's an identified person in there who has either visual hearing um, where accessibility is going to be an issue for that person I think that the faculty have to to scrutinize what they've got coming up and how you know how much time it's going to take us to make the materials accessible you know and often what gets in the that's where we're open more or less for uh, complaints or for lawsuits is right in those kind of gap spontaneous areas where you know if we know about something in advance we can all work together and figure it out but that's not always the case. So the best, you know, prevention strategy is uh, alerting to faculty that when they've got something on their syllabus, they better make sure it's accessible or can be made accessible in a timely manner to serve the student's interest. And, you know, so we're not excluding anyone. So, hello. Is that making sense to everyone, or does yeah. anyone have any suggestions? Do, um, I, I have a question. Do faculty know in advance if they're going to have students who are going to need uh, um, additional help in, what, in, in a variety of formats? It, uh, it depends on the student's uh, desire to be identified. Okay, like, I mean, there is a trap here in that there's confidentiality issues. So if a student you know, ask me, well, like, say in the use of interpreters in classrooms with ASL, um, we're pretty much going to have, that's identified by the fact that the interpreter's in the class, so everyone knows that's happening. Um, but whether or not we can do it in advance, there's slight complications about that. Number one is not everyone ends up being in the class. <laughs> so until the first week or, pay, or uh, payment, fee payment day, you know, we're never really sure what's going to happen. So um, releasing people's names unnecessarily would be something I wouldn't want to engage in. But, um, you know, we can, we, tr we can try. I mean, examples would be, say, foreign students coming in, international people or exchange students in the past. Those campuses have alerted me, say, to a blind person taking biology okay or botany so then we work as a you know invite the faculty and everyone to look at what's in their syllabus and kind of figure out how we're going to manage right to on. convey the same information to someone so you know we try to do it when possible but it's not always like the ideal that i am allowed to contact the faculty in advance or that I even have advance notice I mean because people so up, show up the day of <laughs> of the class and then we have to do something so it seems a little bit of a catch-22 that if the faculty member doesn't know that he or she has one or more students who may require some mm -hmm. sort of disability services you know support and the student gets upset about the fact that there isn't that support if, you know, the faculty all of a sudden right. is kind of going, um, what, what yeah, do do? well, there's timely notification, but there's also the idea of just a super duper awareness of accessibility right. issues That's with true. media. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, just really being aware that um, checking your, your media just in case, because with learning disabilities or sometimes attention deficit disorders, people may be using screen readers. And many more people are starting to use screen readers because they like it. And so we can't really predict. And sometimes like enlargement software is also a big one that's used by people who have visual impairments. And, you know, those are because now there's so many students online <laughs> um, and taking distance classes. I don't have face to face with with people using services sometimes. I mean, that's the reality. And nor do I have face-to-face -face control of teachers who seem to be anywhere with online courses. I mean, they're delivered from all kinds of places. So it can be, you know, it can be a quagmire is what I'm saying. And so basically 
the way to do it, I think, is to people develop a sensitivity and an awareness uh, when they are structuring classes or looking at use of media, use of materials. Another wrinkle too is that students sometimes if they're doing presentations as part of a class will bring in media spontaneously and so that's another one of those know. tricky areas. It is, but where, again, I think we can all become more conscious, conscientious about delivering our messages. You know, like students awareness when you're doing a presentation, accessibility is important. If you need assistance with accessibility, let's look at where you can get that assistance so that the student is then also developing an awareness of other people. And and it is a student, ultimately in life, it's all of our responsibility. In an ideal world, you don't need me, okay? <laughs> because you're all doing this, you're all, you all have the awareness to use good concepts of universal design and be constantly asking yourself, well, the what ifs, you know, uh, as opposed to, well, I'm just going to do it this way, assuming no one in my class has any special needs. And, you know, I think that's in a way the wrong, the approach that leads us the wrong way. Okay. So, I mean, developing the, you know, the questions that you want to be constantly asking. Am I prohibiting anyone from participating in my class by the way that I've structured my class? How could a blind person, how could a deaf person, how could a person who's using a screen reader, what if someone needs an enlarger? Am I being aware of these things? So, you know, I think I think it, it starts to become rule of thumb. My experience with people is that they basically um, start to become vigilant and aware when disability affects their own life, whether it's through a parent, a child, or themselves. And then they're vigilant. <laughs> okay, so, so that's an unfortunate thing. But um, but I think we can, as leaders, you know, spread out a little bit more and convey messages about accessibility. So it sounds like what you're saying is that if we're having students do presentations and they have latitude to do whatever they want, which we might not be able to predict, we could still let them know right. that if they're bringing in anything, they should be aware of accessibility. Accessibility issues, yeah. And and if they want, want assistance to make their project accessible or awareness of accessibility, we can put the resources in there and see how many, you know, take advantage of that. So, okay, so um, one concept is I, I know some websites uh, and people just add uh, options for text only, which I don't know how much of that goes on. So then you're eliminating um, having to do other things like your picture identification and stuff. If somebody's using a screen reader, text only would be the best thing. Um, so I don't know how many people do or use that or if, you know, if that's a possibility in another area of training. Um, and um, let's see, I haven't, do you guys, have you tried to use the YouTube captioning? Anybody? I have, I have, I have oh, but oh, actually I my question for you is, do you guys use a, a captioning service? We do. We have captioning services for films, which we send out. And basically, films after a certain date should already have captions on it. Um, there's smart classrooms or smart carts. I don't know what people are using right now. And who does that? Does anyone in here know who does the smart carts in the classrooms? When The, the smart classrooms are handled by the learning spaces group downstairs. OK. Yeah, and for that's any technology needs. Th there really is, an, and the way OIT works is there's a single point of contact, which is our support center. Mm -hmm. And once you contact them by phone, email, or just mm -hmm. walking in there, um, the support analyst there can help you. If they can't help you immediately and solve the issue. Um, they will pass that on to somebody that can't mm -hmm. within OIT. Right. So really that is 
the place to contact. There is no particular contact person, right? Uh, because if that person is not there, that that doesn't work. And so uh, we, we've had that in the past. That doesn't. We have a single point of contact, which is our support. The ticket, downstairs. and then you get a ticket. Like Don't be a ticket, but I mean that doesn't mean that there's that sounds faceless. That that isn't the case. I mean it gets routed to the right group, the right department. Um, who then handles that from there mm -hmm. um, and it may take more than one step to get it to the right person in an LA. right um, but our system set up that it does get to the right person right and that the problem with accommodations is the timely <clears throat> manner in which they can be delivered yeah. and that's where the list or someone that interfaces is is important and crucial because sometimes things need to be bypassed and handled immediately so that we can get that accommodation made. I mean, that that's the only, you know, sort of reason why I'm saying that we have to have people who are familiar with what the question is. Okay. So if, if, um, if you, if, how do I caption a YouTube uh, video that I'm using in my class tomorrow, if that comes up, then what are we doing that that's kind of my issue is that so, so my response to that and, and I, I hate to make it look like i'm putting you off is if you tell the oot support center that this is a high priority item they will fast track that to whomever needs to help you with that whoever is available at that point because seriously if you have a list of people that person's on annual leave now what i mean there that's that that's why we put the process in place that we have there. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, it works. I, I think I worked with one of your uh, your staff, mm -hmm. uh, Tara? Yeah, on the Blackboard, on the Blackboard issue. issue. Right. Uh, um, and uh, I was able to provide her information, I think, pretty comprehensively on, right. on uh, compliance of that. For the Blackboard. Um, but yeah. that did get routed to the wrong group initially. Right. So yeah, so it's kind of like that's that's where some of the glitches mm -hmm. happen, and you know part of my job, unfortunately, in some ways, is legalities, you know, because the problem is that you know you can be easily, if if a complaint goes into OCR and you have to pay money and all that, I mean, like it's really big, <laughs> so that's why I'm trying to say you know, to stay on top of things so that we don't end up in trouble and having to pay fines and also undergo super inspections of everything, you know, which is what ends up happening when you have complaints is that they look at, oh, well, let's look at all their websites. Okay. So it's not like we're just going to, you know, target one website. We're going to say like, how many places are we out of compliance? All right, and then they, you know, give you recommendations and things that you have to fix by certain dates. And, you know, so like I'm trying to say together in brainstorming the how to's of accessibility, you know, to come up with some solutions so that we can always take action because it's taking the actions that are important and not delaying. Well, part of the trouble I have, and I contacted you early this fall semester, mm -hmm. um, I made 54 videos a couple summers ago right. for my MQ class. They're not closed caption. If I put them on YouTube and use the closed captioning, because I'm hard of hearing, mm -hmm. and when I've tried using that, it's gobbledygook. It is. It's cumbersome. So, You've used it. so. Other That's captioning why I asked if you because a, if right you use a captioning service. Be, but because we've it looked would at charge it too. Our department, I think you said two to three dollars per minute. Right, so exactly. Fifty four videos. Right, I know. So it's astronomically expensive to retro to make those accessible. Mm -hmm. So you know, what what's my best option? YouTube. A grant. <laughs> 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 I mean, you know, to be honest, because that would be the the fastest easiest kind of thing to do um captioning of films and um media is 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 adds an expense mm -hmm. which the proper time to build it in is at the budget when when the things are being created is when you build it in 
because well, because then he, then you have home with a whiteboard using my own computer yeah during the summer so there was no budget for making these videos it, it's possible <laughs> to use the youtube captioning service and then go back and edit it to, to really to correct it and you know how to do that it's been a while but yeah yeah i do okay chris <laughs> and you know also some of the, the softwares are always changing you know things are getting they are getting more accurate the dictation yeah. programs are they're getting better at you know compared to where they used to be a lot of this stuff is you know you read the advertisements like 93 percent accurate or they always have this accuracy thing attached to them but um the bloopers are bad so you know the seven percent or eight percent of the time that mistakes are made they also have to be caught and corrected well and it's one thing with a history class where there's a blooper and people can sort of make an inference of what is meant mm -hmm. but in a math class right if there's a blooper i mean it's already a foreign language right. itself right that that's yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah so it's it, you know it's not easy and i guess my question is where the experts like chris or where the people that are located that can help us when we do get into a jam over something that is not working and that we need to make work or decide beforehand if that's you know not going to be an option for that particular student because it's not going to happen you know um because when we do films it's by the minute and we do have services that we've used before so we're going to be paying per film by the minute um when you get these services in many films uh have already captions on them sometimes people don't know how to access the captions and that's a problem in training um which probably i guess that goes to faculty training or media I'm, I'm not sure who would do the training on that, but it, it would depend on who it's for. If, it, if this is for a class, for a course, mm -hmm. and then where the media is coming from, too, who's providing that, uh, if it's being created. I mean, it, it depends on which group that goes to. Mm -hmm. You know, if that was a lecture capture, then that may be a different group than a. Um, YouTube video of an instructor introducing the course. Mm -hmm. It really, de I mean, it, it depends on the situation and the circumstance. I right. Mean, I, I mean, Gary, correct me if I'm wrong. No, I think that's what, uh, at least from from for OIT, it's that. Yeah, it depends on who you're dealing with. Right. Um, it could come to this group, but it could also go to BCS, or it could go to. Uh, Group right and then there's what of, again uh, what i'm saying is who are the best people that yeah, can yeah. address and you know maybe that's the idea is then there's a pool it's spread out and who has the expertise in this area and how can they help us i mean because that that's the the extent is like what we're going to do not what we can't do so um how we're going to look at the individualized situation and then how we're going to reach a resolution and assist the student to gain access. So how how are faculty currently made aware of um, what you're talking about? Well, there's faculty training. And anybody else from faculty that knows? how faculty are made aware i mean trainings well, are know, offered just reading different things in the profession of things that are, hey if you're making videos or you're doing class online make sure it's closed caption does does joy morrison's office faculty development do anything you know to promote all the things you're talking about to help faculty be aware of, of those concerns she hasn't offered Mm -hmm. anything on this that I know of. Yeah, and I think maybe there should be something But I, I can certainly talk to her yeah. on the committee for faculty development. Yeah. I mean, she's I, off contract until, what, January? Or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I, part of the problem seems to be faculty awareness of the potential for those mm -hmm. problems, yeah. period. You know? mm -hmm. 
let alone being aware of how they can be solved. You know, and, and so that's why I ask the question. Right, so and that's why. Okay, then we're going with. to look at. What's current, I mean, what happens a lot of times is faculty are getting training in online situations themselves, okay? So many faculty trainings are online, correct? I mean, our, we have faculty training things online and basically, um, is it feasible to for OIT to develop some types of online training that would be about accessibility that we could post uh, or, or, you know, as far as the student access, is it possible for OIT to have a um, a button where a student has an accessibility question on a software that they could be, that question could go to your help person? You know, I'm, I'm looking at ease of how and when people know, you know, where there's an issue, they could they could do something. Yes, yeah, streamlining the process through our um, bringing attention to it. You know, by the more you have out there on your sites, uh, on your homepage, um, do you have an accessibility question? Push this button. Um, do you need assistance with a screen reader? Push this button. Um, or is Blackboard accessible? Push this button. I don't know. Just kind of so so everyone can be getting that message, which to raise the awareness level. I mean, those are kinds of thoughts, things to think about. I'm not like looking for a solution today. I'm just bringing up stuff for discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know what I've seen and where I think things can go. More and more people are. Um, definitely falling under ADA protection. So, you know, chances are a lot of times faculty will say, well, I've never had anyone in my class like that. So they think they're exempt from <laughs> from anyone coming around to that. Isn't and that precious? <laughs> no, that's the truth. Yeah. Okay. I've worked here 15 years. That's what I'll hear. And I've never. Okay. Well, I'm trying to prepare you. And yeah, that reminds me of, uh, I, went, I traveled recently for three weeks and I worked with several car rental agencies to get hand controls put in. Huh? Payless and budget were not that good. Enterprise, I recommend, they were very helpful. Payless, over the phone, I was speaking with them. I already had a scheduled appointment. I was checking mm -hmm. in ahead of time. I don't know, there's a communication issue between the corporate office and the local office where mm -hmm. I was actually getting a car from, but the... Uh, I can't remember if it was he or she, over the phone, that person said, well, why don't you just have somebody travel with you? Oh, <laughs> I was like, that is the oh. most ridiculous, <laughs> absurd thing I've ever heard in my life. Yes. It's like, yeah, yeah. the same kind Totally of unaware. Yeah. Oh, what yeah. they're saying. Yeah. yeah. Bigger, I've, I've been traveling for, uh -huh. like, since my injury in 2001. <laughs> never heard that one before. Yeah, well, I hear that. Why well, can't they just have a helper come to class? Okay, yeah, okay, or because, yeah, I mean, no, that's not, that's not going to be the solution that there's another person needed when we have all this, the resources to do it, you know, to make that person independent. Okay, it's just, yeah. So, the, uh, the other thing is, of course, website control which I think is a big issue um, in terms of um, all of our own websites. What is the accessibility level? Are, do we have our alt tags on there? Do we have, um, who, who's managing all of that? And are there online tutorials for people on, for faculty and staff to keep their websites accessible? Is that a possibility? some sort of online tutorial about issues on the websites that come up. Um, and what's our resource for that? Do, you know, do we have, do you do individual consulting? And who would do the individual consulting in order for people to have their websites accessible? Because that, I mean, right now we all use the websites. We have certain choices, you know, to make our pictures or whatever. 
the format is pretty much set and people can pick, right? But then what's the control factor for the accessibility on websites? And is anyone managing that or looking out for that? Is anyone, does anyone ever go through and test it? I don't know what marketing and communication does go through and test it. We do teach it in the website design class, in the Robinson class. Okay. We do show folks to put the alt tag in during the time we're talking about images. And with the template changeover, our programmers have been working on getting an easier method of putting the alt tag in because when they did the switch, the capability was off for a while because they used right. something that wasn't generated in the US and did not follow ADA. So they put a workaround in, and I should be working with the programmers next week learning the new better method so we can incorporate that into class. Okay, so once that's uh, resolved, then is there a go-to place where people can learn that? Like yeah. in a tutorial or something? We don't have a tutorial up yet. Obviously, okay. I have to wait until I know the method okay. to put that one up. Right. But it will be covered as the third Roxon class, the new components class, which only discusses the new items that Okay. And it will be incorporated into the initial class where we first talk about any images. Okay. Yeah, because that's, I mean, <clears throat> that's a big area of compliance that the government is kind of interested in making sure of. <laughs> and so, and those are, you know, there's a lot, of, there are a lot of things out there where people just go to your website and test it with software. And we don't want to get an F. <laughs> I mean, that's, um, but as long as we are taking some form of action and can state what we're doing about any of the inaccessibility issues, then that's a good thing. You know, that we're, we have an awareness of problem A and we're working on it this way and we'll have it worked out. Part of the issue that I have experienced is when I am going through some sort of training is I'm hard of hearing and it doesn't usually show unless I can't hear and then I mm -hmm. cut my ear. But, you know, like I did the, uh, the training this past summer with e-learning. I teach. The I teach. And a lot of things they showed, videos, e I couldn't understand mm -hmm. the words. Well, can you close caption it? Well, it was crap. You know, it didn't make any sense when mm -hmm. you're reading. But having to ask for it, you know, right away signals me out. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why captions on films are great if people just turn them on all the time. Exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, that that's the main thing is then it's, there's everyone in the crowd, particularly when there's a big, crowd of people and you you often see this now is that there's captions running along yeah in you know for any auditorium or any kind of setting that has a larger number of people in it yeah. because nice. they're trying to make it accessible for everyone mm -hmm. and that's you know that's a good thing but are we doing that I would say probably not and you know, are we're, are we behind in the approach? Probably. You know, um, and you know how to change that is what I'm trying to talk about, and where the responsibilities are for changing those kinds of things. Um, and you know, I don't have all the answers in this. I'm just like a little tiny peon in this whole system. So, so I'm just like you know, talking to you guys because you have the stated interest by the fact that you're here, which is a good start. You know. So when, when students come to you, do they come oftentimes with um, tools that they're already using? <clears throat> well, that's a good question. It depends. I mean, what you have to remember about our campus is that the average age of the student is 30. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I see students who are anywhere from 17 to 80. So in that span, we have people who, you know, have been 
since childhood working with school districts and know how to manage their disability and they are aware of what what is out there they have their own software okay we're fine there and then we have another group of people um, who grew up 1974 was when all the schools put in all these different components for so-called special education so at that point schools were testing individuals and identifying people so if you have an age group person you know 40 or higher they probably they could be later in life have a disability that's fairly recent or they could have never been caught in the school district as having that disability because their age in that time they grew up so that's that's a problem you know the range of people people who are newly blind or newly deaf um you're not looking at sign language because they haven't learned it and it's a skill that takes a number of years so then we're looking at putting in other types of technology and you know that's where all your for people whose vision is failing you're going with the screen enlargers um, and you know different enlarging components and again that's all going into the technologies that are now available um, so yeah sometimes we know oh the person comes with a thing a bunch of stuff that they're already comfortable with that they know how to use and that we support that and then other times they could be in the middle of, uh, you know, learning or getting through their degree and have a traumatic brain injury or have some other kind of misfortune befall them. And basically then we're all struggling around, you know, and it can happen in the middle of the semester <laughs> or at the beginning of the semester. So, so dealing with that second set of folks, mm -hmm. um, do you have, I hate to use the word standardized, but a standardized mm -hmm. set of technology that you right. You well, we use on. yes, we do. We you know we we do alternate text formatting, and we try to use a, a thing that the um, mm -hmm. National Federation of the Blind recommends for software for that. We try. I try to purchase or look at the things that are recommended by those powers that are considered to be the recommenders that you know have some sort of cachet that are not you know just saying yo this is the best thing because i like it something like that so i try to you know do those kinds of things that are reliable and maybe have a lot of people using but the pro one problem there is there are so many products on the market anymore that um you know it's hard to keep up with all of that and that's where blackboard and any these other kinds of things that are used as supplementing education are there just so many that um you know i don't know what are the are there are there any universal ones anymore it seems like when it all started there were just one or two you know you had your dragon naturally speaking and you had your that was like the go-to and you had your curd swell and, and now they're all over the place and then two the other problem uh, currently is all the apps okay because there's also all kinds of apps out there that people are personally choosing to use and then wondering about compatibilities right my, my reason for asking is you know in, in situations where those folks need assistance it's difficult to help them if you've never seen the app before or have no experience with whatever exactly technology is you know so i'll just use oit as an example i mean the odds are that somebody isn't going to know mm -hmm. app x and piece of hardware y right and okay let's let's take this example assistive listening devices which there are many types out there and um when and the school district uses like one type okay so when a student comes to uaf we may not have the exact type that the school district use but that's our chosen type and as long as it works then that's the type that is going to be distributed 
Okay. So I think it's the same thing with these software things that it's nice that everyone has their own kind of thing, but we're only obligated to pick one that's going to work and give access. And the person, the user may have to convert to whatever we've chosen or identified, you know, and what would behoove you a in general is if all of our campuses had the same thing. That was my next question. Okay. <laughs> the other that is, is my dream. Okay. <laughs> that we all have UA as a system chooses the software and then it's used in the same way somebody's accessing and design. Okay. And that we have users out there and the number of users part of the issue is there is the number of users users on each campus and the licenses and how that how that would fall out um in terms of cost and you know that that is the ideal right now is that we just choose a couple of things and we everyone can access it the same way as everything else is accessed but if you try to get the three campuses working together on the choices you know, I think that, and then the payments, because we're all going to have, this campus has too few, I and mean, we're one of those campuses that's in the, like, well, should we get, you know, five licenses, one licenses, or then you go up to, you know, the other kind of user licenses, and, you know, that that's the biggest thing, and that would be the best of all, is just to find somebody who's going to manage and spearhead it right into just all uniting all the campuses and having us have all the same things. Do you work closely with your counterparts at UAA and UAS? Right, yeah. Do you, um, do we you talk have back some and kind forth. of feel for Well, I think, you know, I mean, UAF would dominate, I, would, <laughs> I mean, UAA would dominate mm -hmm. the choices, basically. I mean, because they have the most users. So, that would be how it would come down, I would think. But, you know, but then they would have to pay the most. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, uh, it, it's kind of sorting through all that. And that's all budgetary. You know, I can make my recommendations that that happen, but how it's going to be facilitated and who, which I don't know how you guys work as OIT departments between UAA and UAS. Is there okay? Yeah. Uh, I mean. <laughs> Okay. There are, there are areas in where we are cooperative. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay. There are areas where we are cooperative. Could this there are possibly areas be where one? We are not. <laughs> okay. Could this possibly be one that would behoove us to be cooperative? Could it possibly be one? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because, I mean, that that would be helpful. But again, I think yeah. there's like, you know, just it's hard to pull that I, off. I've tried I to pull it off. I think well. I've part, tried to pull it off for the past 14 years and it hasn't happened. Yeah. So I'm not really sure if this new budget climate could make it happen or how, you know. It makes it, it that, that is a, it can be an incentive, mm -hmm. I think. Right. Um, but I think you stated it well. I think that's your dream. It's my dream. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that it could be a reality. Okay, okay. So, any other points of discussion or questions? Think about. I mean, is it possible for for us to look at some online tutorials? I, I think or it's talk to, to Joy to, or figure to out how to yeah. get faculty involved. Do you have any suggestions? Well, having a training focused specifically on explaining the resources to faculty would be the most effective. Okay, a training on resources. Okay. <coughs> and when would you think that would be the best time? Like uh, fall? Yeah. I, I would say every semester. Every semester, every fall. On particularly issues on media accessibility and OIT. Yeah. It's because things, uh, the technology has changed so quickly. Right. And, and I think 
working with the, the full-time faculty is challenging enough, but when you factor in all the adjunct faculty, right. that those are the tough ones because they're not paid to attend mm -hmm. training rooms. And that's why I'm I'm more or less like what what we can do online and on websites and make some sort of connections so that people have an ease of getting the information they need to become compliant. Well, unfortunately, scare tactics kind of work. If you can come up with a, a flyer that has a list of all the places that have been sued and how much it costs them and, hey, heads up, <laughs> make it accessible. Although that, that appeal would probably be more effective with administrators. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when you think about, you know, adjuncts in particular are probably worried about getting their courses set up but getting and their funding students for well doing served. some of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. We'll yeah. And 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 that's students. correct. The the biggest area of where we fall short is the adjuncts. Yeah, I mean I think it's it's a several pronged approach. I mean, the first thing is just information coming from you to get faculty aware of the mm -hmm. fact that, you know, that, by the way, if you're not doing this, you need to know because mm -hmm. you might be doing it. Mm -hmm. you know, and then I think that you know, the, the second component uh, probably is to um, sit down with, with the OIT and say, okay, how, how, can the, how can we provide training in these things? Because, I mean, the role of OIT is, would, would not be one of get the word out that you need to do this. Right. right. That's my job. Right. And your job is a training. But I think OIT could certainly facilitate, you know, the training in some form or another. I'm not sure what that would look like, you know, because we operate under the same budgetary constraints mm -hmm. that everybody else, mm -hmm. else does as to what we do potentially could do, but I think, you know, there's certainly always room to improve what mm -hmm. we do, you know, and how we do it. And so that, that would certainly be worth a, a discussion. Yeah, I, and I think that especially, I mean, this, if your administration's aware, mm -hmm. you know, the minute our administration became aware we weren't complying with Title IX, 98.5% of us took training within three months. Yeah. Okay, so why? Because we were afraid that we're going to have million dollar lawsuits. That's right. what our administration was afraid of. I'm, right. I mean, I'm just this is right. the, this is reality. This is yeah. what happened. And that's why. Yeah. So and the administration is still. And all of a sudden, there was yeah. time. There were resources. There was mm -hmm. money ready to throw at training, advertisement, mm -hmm. compliance, mm -hmm. and everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, at, at that point, we need an online component and, and OIT helped make that that training was mm -hmm. available through a online component. Right. Um, yeah, I no, I know? agree with you. And right now, I think that's still, the Title IX is still like the major priority around campus. And, you know, how, I guess we need our own sort of title thing, you know, uh, or uh, something that makes it a tidal wave. <laughs> well, ADA, ADA compliance isn't that? Yeah, right? yeah, it is. I know, but until, I mean, basically, the Title IX thing is generated because of the inspection that the federal government cast upon us. You know, I mean, we had a big shadow cast by that whole issue, and and it also was is continuously a national issue. So you know that also brought it to the front because there was so much national publicity from every newspaper in America and that's kind of what they were looking at. You know, our name was muddied, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, but, but, but I think that at least for, for me, it, when the administration says, okay, we need to address this, I'm gonna need to do it now. Mm -hmm. Um, that trickles down to directors and mm -hmm. deans and supervisors and managers, at which point it gets it gets, the attention. It gets done mm -hmm. because it becomes a priority. Right. And I think that it hasn't. It isn't. Okay. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I think you talk to any faculty or staff member and say, we're all overloaded. We all have too much to do and mm -hmm. not enough time to do it. Mm -hmm. And so 
you do what's at the top of your priority list. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? Title IX all of a sudden bumped to the top of the priority list. And the same is going to have to happen here, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, this has been very informative. I appreciate you coming. Well, well, thanks. I, you know, I appreciate the opportunity. I'm trying to. What you're doing to... and what you're thinking and, and what the needs are. So, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So, appreciate and I, I think I'll, you know, I, I will, t I, I do talk to administrators, but right, I think right now it's kind of hard to get attention because I don't want to make it so. Sure. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. So, absolutely. Thank you. Think, you. Uh, would you? I saw you were taking notes down. That would be. Would, would you mind emailing me those? No.